okay. Is this, I think this is on. Let's see here. Okay. There we go. Oh, good morning, everyone. Good morning, and welcome to Perth Andover Baptist Church. I'm, uh, I'm super glad to be here with you all this morning, and a special welcome to you as well if you're watching online. If uh, you are new and you don't know me or don't recognize me, my name is Nathan Drover, and I'm the lead pastor here of a team of pastors. And I'm, I'm really excited to be here with you this morning. Uh, I look forward to Sunday uh, morning every, every week. So it's, it's such a great morning to be with you. Uh, just as a reminder for you who are here in person, we do require masks to be worn at all times during the service. Still in the midst of this thing, but uh, hopefully, um, you know, through prayer and things like that, things will start looking up soon. That's what I'm hoping for. Don't, don't have any, like, advanced warning on that or anything, but, you know, I'm sure we're all hoping at this point for this just to get over and, and be done. So, anyway... Um, For our call to worship this morning, I wanted to read out from uh, the first few verses of Psalm 105. The the timer actually uh, caught me by surprise a little bit this morning, so I haven't found it. Okay, here we go. Yeah, so Psalm 105, um, the first uh, six verses of this psalm. Let me just read them out for us. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him, sing praises to him, tell of all his wondrous works. Glory in his holy name, let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord and his strength, seek his presence continually. Remember the wondrous works that he has done, his miracles and judgments he uttered. O offspring of Abraham, his servant, children of Jacob, his chosen ones. This morning, that's essentially what we're going to do. We're going to remember the miraculous works and the wonders that God has done throughout history. And they're actually the exact same ones that the psalmist recounts uh, throughout that psalm. So, uh, with that being said, uh, that's where we're going this morning. We're going to wonder and uh, reflect on God's marvelous works. So, let's open in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you that you are with us this morning. We trust that uh, as we uh, worship you in um, reflection and song, we trust that you will meet us um, where we are, that those of us who need comfort, uh, God would be comforted, that those of us who need challenge would be challenged, and those of us who need strengthening would be strengthened. Father, I pray that as... uh, We look into your word this morning that we would be struck by your wonder and greatness and your power. God, meet us uh, and be with us now. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, everyone. It's good to see you all. The first song that we're going to do this morning is a song, it's a traditional melody that everybody will recognize. I'll just call it a traditional Gaelic melody for now, but the words are about God through the ages. There are four verses, and the first one is about the past, God in the past, and then the second verse is God today, and then the third verse is God in the future. So I hope that the words as they are on the screen will um, help Uh, Turn your mind to our God who is eternal. ship 
So if you're trying to place that melody, that's morning has broken, and sometimes we sing it at Christmas as child in the manger. Great words right in our hymn book. For our next song, we're going to be learning about the, the ten plagues of Egypt today. And um, <coughs> the God who did all those things with all that power is the same God we worship today. And here's our friend. So we're going to sing about the God of Angel Armies. You hear me when I call. You are my morning song. Though darkness fills the night, it cannot hide the light. Whom shall Crush the enemy underneath my feet. You are my sword and shield, though troubles linger still. Whom shall I?
invite the kids to stand up, everybody to stand up. We're going to do a VBS song, Not Forgotten, because that amazing, powerful God knows us. The words will be on the screen. The singing will happen for us. We get to do all those fun actions. Morning. That is hard to do without singing. <laughs> All righty. Before we go into some announcements, look at coming up this week. Get my right day. So today is Sunday. Yeah. So today we have an anniversary. Michael and Catherine Mann. Happy anniversary. On Wednesday, we have a birthday for Osha Goodine. On Thursday, a birthday for Isaiah Fournier and an anniversary for John and Marie Everett. So happy birthday and happy anniversary in advance to everyone there. Uh, announcement wise, um, forget the children's program. It's good to see that up and getting back up and going. So partway through the service, they'll be, uh, be uh, excused for that. Youth group tonight is 6.30 and young adults group to follow at eight. Don't forget that through the week, Tuesday to Thursday, from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m., uh, it's just pastoral drop-in time. Stop in and uh, talk to the pastors, Sheila and uh, Nathan. And, uh, yeah, I'd like to chat with you for sure. Any issues, any concerns, or just, just uh, to catch up. Uh, Horizon Health continues to use the church uh, for vaccinations and rapid test distribution. And uh, there's going to be various times over the months that they'll, we'll share with those. And Christmas video, see if I can get this right this week. The Christmas video by the river, so the filming is going to take place on November the 27th. So the filming, and sometime in December we'll, we'll see that all come through fruition. So, so filming on the 27th of November, and if you can do a reading or music, contact Kat or Sabrina. So look forward to that. For groups, uh, Sheila's Group for Women continues Monday, November 15th at noon right here at the church. Prayer walk continues um, on Tuesday, 1.30, meet at the parking lot, arena, arena parking lot, sorry. Care groups uh, continuing. Uh, the next one for um, Cameron's, the unsettling solution for just about everything, will be Tuesday, November the 23rd. So to, not this Tuesday, so next Tuesday the 23rd. 
My group will start this week on the 18th, Thursday the 18th, so three weeks in a row, and we're going to be looking at the, uh, the sermon based, all the Exodus, and discussing that and some questions on that, so looking forward to doing that. And uh, proof of vaccination is required for care groups for those. And that is all I have. The uh, kids can be dismissed there for the river, so if you are a child, you're allowed to leave. If you're an adult, you're you're stuck here. No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I just want to, I think... I think the timing got mentioned, I, I kind of zoned out there for a second, so apologies, Rodney, thank you for doing the announcements. Um, the prayer walk is this week moved to the afternoon, I believe it's 1.30, uh, so I just wanted to emphasize that and say again, we continue to go out and uh, pray for um, the uh, students, so we've got the elementary school, the high school, the middle school, and we're praying also for the uh, civic center and the community events that happen there, as well as the manor, so I want to invite you to come out to that if you are able. Um, I know it's getting colder, I know it's uh, getting harder to to come out to that thing, but uh, Sheila and I will will be there, so if uh, you feel God is calling you to join us in praying for our community in that way, then I would invite you out. And of course, if you can't come out, I would still encourage you to take, you know, maybe 15 minutes at that time and just set that time aside to pray for our community and students and schools. All right, so uh, with that being said, uh, I just want to open us up in a word of prayer before we get into God's word this morning. Father, as we come to your word now, we pray that you would show us your power and your might. In our hearing, display your signs and wonders before us. May our hearts marvel and our minds be struck with awe as we contemplate your greatness and majesty. We pray that you would accomplish these things through my words and in our hearts. Uh, In Jesus' name by the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, on the one hand, there is order. The systematic structuring of things. Birds in the air, fish in the sea, and mammals on land. The sun rises in the morning and sets in the evening. Crops grow and people are healthy. In an ordered world, life is consistent safe, and predictable. But on the other hand, there is chaos, the lack of order, floods, crashing waves and storms, water spontaneously changing into blood, animals spontaneously dying and disease spontaneously spreading, plagues of locusts, darkness during the day. In a chaotic world, life is inconsistent, dangerous, and unpredictable. If we were to see the world around us through ancient Egyptian eyes, we would see the world as a struggle between order and chaos. We see, in our modern 21st century context, the world through the stability of science. But ancient Egyptians believed that the forces of chaos were always a present threat to ordered life. At the center of this struggle was the Egyptian pharaoh. Above all else, the pharaoh was responsible for maintaining order within his kingdom. As a divine-like ruler, pharaoh carried out the will of the Egyptian gods. And by carrying out the will of the gods, Pharaoh kept the forces of chaos at bay. In the eyes of the ancient Egyptians, there was simply no other option. It was either the way of Pharaoh or chaos. This background is going to be crucial for us this morning as we read through our biblical text. As we saw last week, Pharaoh has increased the sufferings of God's people 
called the Israelites. Pharaoh believes that he has the right to their labor and service, and that Yahweh, the name of Israel's God, is nothing more than a little nuisance. In the first six chapters of Exodus, Pharaoh's command determined life or death, prosperity or servitude for the Hebrew people. And he's not about to let things change. If Yahweh wants his people to be free and for them to serve him alone, then he is going to have to free them from Pharaoh's grip. And so the question the book of Exodus now poses for us is this. Is Yahweh a match for Pharaoh, the divine ruler who maintains order over his Egyptian kingdom? This morning, what we're going to see is what it looks like for Yahweh to go to battle for his people. Now that Pharaoh has thrown down the gauntlet and accepted Yahweh's challenge, Yahweh is ready to step into the ring. And through this cosmic conflict, we will learn who is really in control. We will learn who is really in control over the forces of order and chaos. We will learn who really has the right to rule over Israel. But before we get into our sermon this morning, I need to talk about a practical problem. This story is long. It begins in Exodus chapter 7 and ends in Exodus chapter 12, and even that is really cutting the story off prematurely. And so all week, I've been facing this practical question. How do I preach on five chapters in one sermon? And my conclusion was that you don't. We're not going to cover the whole story in detail in one sermon. Instead, we're going to break it up into two parts, which is why um, this is just part one of of this this sermon. Uh, This week, our goal is going to be to look at really the big picture, the main theme of the story. And next week, we'll address a number of questions that I'm sure will come up in your minds as we read through this text, like, you know, how should we understand the hardening of Pharaoh's heart? But for this morning, we're really only trying to answer one question. Who is ultimately supreme, Yahweh or Pharaoh? Who really governs the forces of order and chaos and therefore has the right to rule over Israel. Now, as I'm sure most of you already will suspect, this morning we will see that it is in fact Yahweh, the God of Exodus, who is supreme. He, and no one else, has the right to our worship. He alone is Lord, and he alone is able to deliver us. Now, in order to see all of this, I genuinely think the best way is to simply read this story. This is one of those stories that I hope will speak for itself. And so this morning, the sermon's going to be a little bit different. We're going to focus on the story of God's wonders and plagues as it is told in the book of Exodus. But we're really going to be mostly focusing on that story. So I'm going to make a few comments after each plague and after each event, but Like I said, we're mostly going to focus on reading the text. So with that being said, it's going to all be up on the screen. Uh, Would you please join me, uh, if you have your Bibles or your phones with you, in reading Exodus chapter 7, verse 1, and we're going to go to verse 13. I'll be reading this morning from the New Living Translation. Then Yahweh said to Moses, Pay close attention to this. I will make you seem like God to Pharaoh, and your brother Aaron will be your prophet. Tell Aaron everything I command you, and Aaron must command Pharaoh to let the people of Israel leave his country. But I will make Pharaoh's heart stubborn, so I can multiply my miraculous signs and wonders in the land of Egypt. Even then, Pharaoh will will refuse to listen to you. So I will bring down my fist on Egypt. 
Then I will rescue my forces, my people, the Israelites, from the land of Egypt with great acts of judgment. When I raise my powerful hand and bring out the Israelites, the Egyptians will know that I am Yahweh. So Moses and Pharaoh did just as Yahweh had commanded them. Moses was 80 years old and Aaron was 83 when they made their demands to Pharaoh. Then Yahweh said to Moses and Aaron, Pharaoh will demand, show me a miracle. When he does this, say to Aaron, take your staff and throw it down in front of Pharaoh and it will become a serpent. So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and did what Yahweh had commanded them. Aaron threw down his staff before Pharaoh and his officials and it became a serpent. Then Pharaoh called in his own wise men and sorcerers and these Egyptian magicians did the same thing with their magic. They threw down their staffs, which also became serpents. But then Aaron's staff swallowed up their staffs. Pharaoh's heart, however, remained hard. He still refused to listen, just as Yahweh had predicted. We need to make two quick comments on this introductory confrontation. First, as you will notice in every section that I read out from now on, and including this one, the conflict of this story is truly between Yahweh and Pharaoh. Every plague begins with Yahweh telling Moses what to do. Moses is simply the mediator between Pharaoh and Yahweh. As chapter 7, verse 10 says, Moses and Aaron just do what Yahweh had commanded them to do. Second, we need to briefly talk about the Egyptian magicians. Most people want to know how did they accomplish the same thing that God did through magic? Do they have some supernatural power or is it just some type of trickery like modern magic tricks today? Unfortunately, the text just simply doesn't tell us. But we shouldn't get so focused on that question that we lose sight of the real point of the magicians. They represent Pharaoh's power. In the conflict between Yahweh and Pharaoh, Yahweh performs his wonders through Moses. Pharaoh and his gods perform their wonders through the magicians. In the end, though, Yahweh's power is seen in that Aaron's staff swallows up the staffs of Pharaoh's magicians. And this brings us to our next confrontation. Then Yahweh said to Moses, Pharaoh's heart is stubborn, and he still refuses to let the people go. So go to Pharaoh in the morning as he goes down to the river. Stand in the bank of the Nile and meet him there. Be sure to take along the staff that turned into a snake. Then announce to him, Yahweh, the God of the Hebrews, has sent me to tell you, let my people go so they can worship me on, in the wilderness. Until now, you have refused to listen to me. So this is what Yahweh says. I will show you that I am Yahweh. Look, I will strike the water of the Nile with this staff in my hand, and the river will turn to blood. The fish in it will die, and the river will stink. The Egyptians will not be able to drink any water from the Nile. Then Yahweh said to Moses, Tell Aaron, take your staff and raise your hand over the waters of Egypt, all its rivers, canals, ponds, and all the reservoirs. Turn all the water to blood. Everywhere in Egypt, the water will turn to blood, even the water stored in wooden bowls and stone pots. So Moses and Aaron did just as Yahweh commanded them. As Pharaoh and all of his officials watched, Aaron raised his staff and struck the water of the Nile. Suddenly, the whole river turned to blood. The fish in the river died, and water became so foul that the Egyptians couldn't drink it. There was blood everywhere throughout the land of Egypt. But again, the magicians of Egypt used their magic, and they too turned water into blood. So Pharaoh's heart remained hard. He refused to listen to Moses and Aaron just as Yahweh had predicted. Pharaoh returned to his palace and put the whole thing out of his mind. 
Then all the Egyptians dug along the river bank to find drinking water, for they couldn't drink the water from the Nile. Seven days passed from the time that Yahweh struck the Nile. This wonder is much larger than the first. The water of the Nile, the main river that flows through Egypt, is turned to blood. The Nile was both literally and figuratively uh, the source of Egypt's life. Literally, it provided water for crops to grow and for people to drink. Metaphorically, it was the Nile that enabled Egypt to be the great civilization that it was in the ancient world. The Nile itself was even personified and worshipped as a god. But this source of life becomes a source of death. When the river turned to blood, according to verse 21, the fish in the river died and the water became foul so that the Egyptians couldn't drink it. The life source of Egypt has become an omen of chaos and destruction. But Pharaoh remains unmoved. Then Yahweh said to Moses, Go back to Pharaoh and announce to him, This is what Yahweh says, Let my people go so they can worship me. If you refuse to let them go, I will send a plague of frogs across your entire land. The Nile River will swarm with frogs. They will come up out of the river and into your palace, even into your bedroom and onto your bed. They will enter the houses of your officials and your people. They will even jump into your ovens and your kneading bowls. Frogs will jump on you, your people, and all your officials. Then Yahweh said to Moses, Tell Aaron, raise the staff in your hand over all the rivers, canals, and ponds of Egypt, and bring up frogs over all the land. So Aaron raised his hand over the waters of Egypt, and frogs came up and covered the whole land. But the magicians were able to do the same thing with their magic, they too caused frogs to come up on the land of Egypt. Side note, as if that would be a help. Then Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron and begged, plead with Yahweh to take the frogs away from me and my people. I will let your people go so they can offer sacrifices to Yahweh. You set the time, Moses replied. Tell me when you want me to pray for you, your officials and your people. Then you and your houses will be rid of the frogs. They will remain only in the Nile River. Do it tomorrow, Pharaoh said. All right, Moses replied. It will be as you have said. Then you will know that there is no one like Yahweh our God. The frogs will leave you and your houses, your officials and your people. They will remain only in the Nile River. So Moses and Aaron left Pharaoh's palace, and Moses cried out to Yahweh about the frogs he had inflicted on Pharaoh. And Yahweh did just what Moses had predicted. The frogs in the houses, the courtyards, and the fields all died. The Egyptians piled them into great heaps, and a terrible stench filled the land. But when Pharaoh saw that relief had come, he became stubborn. He refused to listen to Moses and Aaron, just as Yahweh predicted. The chaos of Yahweh's wonders continues. While we might not think of it as being of too big of a deal, the frogs being in people's beds and in their dishes would have been seen as disorder and chaotic. I'm sure you can imagine that yourself if frogs suddenly swarmed your house. Frogs have their place in the world. They belong around ponds and swamps and other bodies of water, but they do not belong in beds and dishes. Their invasion into human civilization was an assault on the order of the world. But Yahweh does not only have the power to create chaos. He also has the power to restore order. Yahweh rids the houses of the frogs, and they only remain in the Nile, where they belong. In verse 10, Moses makes it clear that this should teach Pharaoh that there is no one like Yahweh, our God. 
Yahweh's ability to stop the plague is also a sign of his unique power. Yahweh is able to bring chaos and restore order in a realm that is supposed to be under Pharaoh's domain. But Pharaoh still refuses to learn this lesson. So Yahweh said to Moses, Tell Aaron, raise your staff and strike the ground. The dust will turn into swarms of gnats throughout the land of Egypt. So Moses and Aaron did just as Yahweh had commanded them. When Aaron raised his hand and uh, struck the ground with his staff, gnats infested the entire land, covering the Egyptians and their animals. All the dust in the land of Egypt turned into gnats. Pharaoh's magicians tried to do the same thing with their secret arts, but this time they failed. And the gnats covered everyone, people and animals alike. This is the finger of God, the magicians exclaimed to Pharaoh. But Pharaoh's heart remained hard. He wouldn't listen to them, just as Yahweh predicted. The only thing we need to point out here is that from now on, the magicians will not be able to replicate Yahweh's wonders. In verse 19, they point out to Pharaoh that these wonders are a sign or done from the finger of God. In other words, these magicians are over their heads. The power of Pharaoh and his gods have reached their limit. But Yahweh is not yet done. Then Yahweh told Moses, get up early in the morning and stand in Pharaoh's way as he goes down to the river. Say to him, this is what Yahweh says, let my people go so they can worship me. If you refuse, then I will send swarms of flies on you, your officials, your people, and all the houses. The Egyptian homes will be filled with flies, and the ground will be covered with them. But this time, I will spare the region of Goshen, where my people live. No flies will be found there. Then you will know that I am Yahweh, and that I am present even in the heart of your land. I will make a clear distinction between my people and your people. This miraculous sign will happen tomorrow. And Yahweh did just as he had said. A thick swarm of flies filled Pharaoh's palace and the houses of his officials. The whole land of Egypt was thrown into chaos by the flies. And then skipping down to verse 28. All right, uh, Moses is talking with Pharaoh at this point. All right, go ahead, Pharaoh replied. I will let you go into the wilderness to offer sacrifices to Yahweh your God. But don't go too far away. Now hurry and pray for me. Moses answered, As soon as I leave you, I will pray to Yahweh, and tomorrow the swarms of flies will disappear from you and your officials and all your people. But I am warning you, Pharaoh, don't lie to us again and refuse to let the people go to sacrifice to Yahweh. So Moses left Pharaoh's palace and pleaded with Yahweh to remove all the flies. And Yahweh did as Moses asked and caused the swarms of flies to disappear from Pharaoh, his officials, and his people. Not a single fly remained, but Pharaoh again became stubborn and refused to let the people go. There are two, again, two quick things we need to see here. The first is that things are getting more intense. According to verse 24, the whole land of Egypt was thrown into chaos by the flies. Other translations say that the land became ruined. The chaos of Yahweh's wonders is beginning to have a destructive effect on Egypt. And once again, we should notice that the Pharaoh is unable to prevent it. The Pharaoh who is supposed to be able to maintain order in his kingdom is unable to resist the force of Yahweh's wonders. But the second thing we need to see is that Yahweh is able to control these forces. 
Unlike Pharaoh, Yahweh can protect his people. As he says in verse 23, I will make a clear distinction between my people and your people. And yet, Pharaoh still refuses to let Yahweh's people go. Go back to Pharaoh, Yahweh commanded Moses. Tell him, this is what Yahweh, the God of the Hebrews, says. Let my people go so they can worship me. If you continue to hold them and refuse to let them go, the hand of Yahweh will strike all your livestock, your horses, donkeys, camels, cattle, sheep, and goats with a deadly plague. But Yahweh will again make a distinction between the livestock of the Israelites and that of the Egyptians. Not a single one of Israel's animals will die. Yahweh has already set the time for the plague to begin. He has declared that he will strike the land tomorrow. And Yahweh did just as he had said. The next morning, all the livestock of the Egyptians died, but the Israelites didn't lose a single animal. Pharaoh sent his officials to investigate, and they discovered that the Israelites had not lost a single animal. But even so, Pharaoh's heart remained stubborn and he still refused to let people go. Once again, the chaos and destruction continue, continues to be unleashed on the Egyptian people. Their animals are hit with a deadly disease, and once again, Pharaoh is unable to protect them from it. He's unable to restrain the chaos and establish order in his domain. At the same time, Yahweh protects his people from the effects of the plagues. But Pharaoh's heart, once again, remains stubborn. Then Yahweh said to Moses and Aaron, Take handfuls of soot from the brick kiln and have Moses toss it into the air while Pharaoh watches. The ashes will spread like fine dust over the whole land of Egypt, causing festering boils to break out on the people and animals throughout the land. So they took soot from a brick kiln and went and stood before Pharaoh. As Pharaoh watched, Moses threw the soot into the air, and boils broke out on the people and animals alike. Even the magicians were unable to stand before Moses because the boils had broken out on them and all the Egyptians." But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and just as Yahweh had predicted to Moses, Pharaoh refused to let them go. From the third plague until now, the magicians have been unable to reproduce Yahweh's wonders. But now they cannot even protect themselves from Yahweh's power. If the magicians represent the powers of Pharaoh, Egypt's gods, and Egypt as a whole, then their power at this point is completely broken. They are unable even to stand in Moses' presence. Yahweh's wonders are now completely unrivaled. And we're only on plague number six. Then Yahweh said to Moses, Get up early in the morning and stand before Pharaoh. Tell him, This is what Yahweh, the God of the Hebrews, says. Let my people go so they can worship me. If you don't, I will send more plagues on you and your officials and your people. Then you will know that there is no one like me in all the earth. By now, I could have lifted my hand and struck you and your people with a plague to wipe you off the face of the earth. But I have spared you for a purpose, to show you my power and to spread my fame throughout the earth. But you still lord it over my people and refuse to let them go. So tomorrow at this time, I will send a hailstorm more devastating than any in all the history of Egypt. Quick, order your livestock and servants to come in from the fields to find shelter. Any person or animal left outside will die when the hail falls. Some of Pharaoh's officials were afraid because of what Yahweh had said. 
they quickly brought their servants and livestock in from the fields. But those who paid no attention to the word of Yahweh left theirs out in the open. Then Yahweh said to Moses, Lift your hand toward the sky so hail may fall on the people, the livestock, and all the plants throughout the land of Egypt. So Moses lifted his staff toward the sky, and Yahweh sent thunder and hail and lightning flashed toward the earth. Yahweh sent a tremendous hailstorm against all the land of Egypt. Never in all the history of Egypt had there been a storm like that, with such devastating hail and continuous lightning. It left uh, all of Egypt in ruins. The hail struck down everything in the open field, people, animals, and plants alike. Even the trees were destroyed. The only place with hail was the region of Goshen, where the people of Israel lived. Then Pharaoh quickly summoned Moses and Aaron. This time I have sinned, he confessed. Yahweh is the righteous one, and my people and I are wrong. Please beg Yahweh to end this terrifying thunder and hail. We've had enough. I will let you go. You don't need to stay any longer. All right, Moses replied. As soon as I leave the city, I will lift my hands and pray to Yahweh. Then the thunder and hail will stop, and you will know that the earth belongs to Yahweh. But I know that you and your officials still do not fear Yahweh God. Skipping down to verse 33. So Moses left Pharaoh's court and went out of the city. When he lifted his hands to Yahweh, the thunder and hail stopped, and the downpour ceased. But when Pharaoh saw that the rain, hail, and thunder had stopped, he and his officials sinned again, and Pharaoh again became stubborn. Because his heart was hard, Pharaoh refused to let the people leave, just as Yahweh had predicted through Moses. Of all the plagues so far, this is by far the most chaotic. The weather goes berserk, casting hail and lightning on everything that is in the open fields. Trees, people, and animals alike are all destroyed. The natural world is consuming and destroying itself. Once again, I want to make clear that it is actually this type of chaos that Pharaoh was supposed to prevent. In Egyptian eyes, by doing the will of the gods, Pharaoh should have been able to maintain order. But instead, it is Yahweh who has the ability to maintain order or unleash chaos. The only place where hail did not fall was the place where Yahweh's people lived. And yet, in the end of even this, Pharaoh still refuses to let them leave. Then Yahweh said to Moses, Return to Pharaoh and make your demands again. I have made him and his officials stubborn, so I can display my miraculous signs among them. I've also done it so that you can tell your children and grandchildren about how I made a mockery of the Egyptians and about the signs I displayed among them. And so you will know that I am Yahweh. So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said, This is what Yahweh, the God of the Hebrews, says. How long will you refuse to submit to me? Let my people go so they can worship me. If you refuse, watch out. For tomorrow I will bring a swarm of locusts on your country. They will cover the land so that you won't be able to see the ground. They will devour what little is left of your crops after the hailstorm, including all the trees growing in the fields. They will overrun your palaces and your homes of your officials and all the houses of Egypt. Never in the history of Egypt have your ancestors seen a plague like this one. And with that, Moses turned and left Pharaoh. Skipping down to verse 12. Then Yahweh said to Moses, Raise your hand over the land of Egypt to bring on the locusts. Let them cover the land and devour every plant that survived the hailstorm. So Moses raised his staff over Egypt, and Yahweh caused an east wind to blow over the land all that day and through the night. When morning arrived, the east wind had brought the locusts. 
And the locusts swarmed over the whole land of Egypt, settling in dense swarms from one end of the country to the other. It was the worst locust plague in Egyptian history, and there has never been another one like it. For the locusts covered the whole country and darkened the land. They devoured every plant in the fields and all the fruit on the trees that had survived the hailstorm. Not a single leaf was left on the trees and plants throughout the land of Egypt. Pharaoh quickly summoned Moses and Aaron. I have sinned against Yahweh your God and against you, he confessed. Forgive my sin just this once and plead with Yahweh your God to take away this death from me. So Moses left Pharaoh's court and pleaded with Yahweh. Yahweh responded by shifting the wind and the strong west, uh, and the strong west wind blew the locusts into the Red Sea. Not a single locust remained in all the land of Egypt, but, the, but Yahweh hardened Pharaoh's heart again, so he refused to let the people go. We might assume that the locusts are a step down from the hailstorm uh, that just happened. But as the text describes, locusts are devastating to a country's food supply. Just to give you an illustration of this, a one square kilometer swarm can eat as much food as 35,000 people in one day. In modern day terms, a locust plague can cost billions of dollars in crop, uh, crop damage. In other words, this locust plague is not a step down in severity. The chaos continues to ramp up. God tells us the point of all of these signs and wonders in chapter 10, verse 2. He says that the Israelites should tell their children and grandchildren these stories so that they will know that he is Yahweh. These stories, in other words, continue to reveal over and over that Yahweh is the one who is in ultimate control. He has total authority over every sphere of creation. Yahweh, and Yahweh alone, maintains cosmic order and can cause cosmic level chaos. Pharaoh, his gods, and the magicians can do nothing. just finding my place here. Oh, there we go. Okay. Then Yahweh said to Moses, lift your hand toward heaven and the land of Egypt will be covered with a darkness so thick you can feel it. So Moses lifted his hand to the sky and a deep darkness covered the entire land of Egypt for three days. During all that time, the people could not see each other and no one moved, but there was light as usual where the people of Israel lived. Now skipping down to verse 27. But Yahweh hardened Pharaoh's heart once more, and he would not let them go. Get out of here, Pharaoh shouted at Moses. I'm warning you, never come back to see me again. The day you see my face, you will die. Very well, Moses replied. I will never see your face again. What would your response be if the sun did not rise tomorrow, or the next day, or the next day? I think it would be pretty frightening, like maybe the world was about to end. And if you and I would feel that way, even with modern electricity, it is also undoubtedly how the Egyptians felt when their land was covered in darkness. Now, it's not exactly the same situation, because the sun did actually rise. The people of Israel had light as usual. Yahweh continues to maintain cosmic order for his people, but cause cosmic chaos for the Egyptians. But the thing is about this plague in particular is that many people, Egyptians, I guess, would have believed that Pharaoh should have been able to help his people in this instance. One of the most famous gods of Egypt was the sun god named Ra or sometimes Re. Some Egyptians even believed that Pharaoh was Ra's son. So if there was any realm 
that Pharaoh uh, could maintain order over. It was the realm of light. And yet, once again, even here, Pharaoh is completely powerless. We're going to pick up reading in chapter 11, verse 4. Um, Moses had announced to Pharaoh, This is what Yahweh says, At midnight tonight I will pass through the heart of Egypt. All the firstborn sons will die in every family in Egypt, from the oldest son of Pharaoh who sits on his throne to the oldest son of his lowliest servant girl who grinds the flour. Even the firstborn of all the livestock will die. Then a loud wail will rise throughout the land of Egypt, a wail like no one has heard before or will ever hear again. But among the Israelites it will be so peaceful that not even a dog will bark. Then you will know that Yahweh makes a distinction between the Egyptians and the Israelites. And we're going to skip all the way down to chapter 12, verses 29 and 30. And that night, at midnight, Yahweh struck down all the firstborn sons in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn son of Pharaoh, who sat on his throne, to the firstborn son of the prisoner in the dungeon. Even the firstborn of their livestock were killed. Pharaoh and all his officials and all the people of Egypt woke up during the night, and loud wailing was heard throughout the land of Egypt. There was not a single house where someone had not died. This was the final blow. There is no elaborate description. The judgment is simply stated. There was not a single Egyptian household where someone had not died. Now, we might have moral questions about what God does here. And we're going to talk about those more next week. But when it comes to Yahweh's power... There are no questions. He holds life and death in his hand. Not Pharaoh, not Ra, not Anubis or Osiris or Hathor or any of the other Egyptian deities. Yahweh and Yahweh alone is supreme. And so at this point, there is only one more thing for Pharaoh to do. He will now finally send Israel out to serve Yahweh, their God. Picking up in verse 31. Pharaoh sent for Moses and Aaron during the night. Get out, he ordered. Leave my people and take the rest of the Israelites with you. Go and worship Yahweh as you have requested. Take your flocks and herds as you said and be gone. Go but bless me as you leave. All the Egyptians urged the people of Israel to get out of the land as quickly as possible, for they thought, we will all die. Skipping down to verse 40. The people of Israel had lived in Egypt for 430 years. In fact, it was on the last day of the 430th year that all Yahweh's forces left the land. On this night, Yahweh kept his promise to bring his people out of the land of Egypt. So this night belongs to him, and it must be commemorated every year by all the Israelites from generation to generation. Yahweh has now fulfilled his promise. Way back in chapter 2, he heard the outcry of the Israelites and remembered his covenant promises that he made to them. In chapters 3 and 4, he called Moses to be his ambassador and promised that he would deliver Israel out of the hand of Egypt. And in chapter 6, Yahweh recommitted himself to fulfilling that very promise. And now, finally, at the end of chapter 12, the promise is fulfilled. Israel is now free. In the ancient world, Pharaoh and the gods of Egypt would have been one of the most powerful forces imaginable. The political, religious, cultural, and economic power of Pharaoh 
would have seen, seemed unrivaled in the eyes of the Egyptians. But after his wonders, the cosmic conflict between Pharaoh and Yahweh is over. Yahweh and Yahweh alone is Lord over the forces of order and chaos in the cosmos. And that includes Egypt, its Pharaoh, and the Israelite people. Yahweh is supreme. Now, before we finish our sermon this morning, I want to quickly point out three ways that the supremacy of Yahweh makes a difference for our lives today. We will also dig more deeply into these next week, so we're not we're just skimming the surface here. First, Yahweh's supremacy means there is no power from which he cannot deliver you. There are many evil forces in this world, and from our perspective, these forces are powerful, real, and significant. And to us, they certainly are. And yet, in comparison to Yahweh, they are ultimately powerless. Nothing rivals Yahweh's power. It would be like a mouse challenging Sidney Crosby to a hockey game. There is no comparison. Yahweh is supreme. And that means that there is no evil that he cannot deliver you from through Jesus Christ. Second, Yahweh's supremacy means there is no promise that he cannot keep. Pharaoh could not prevent Yahweh from keeping his promise to Israel. And no evil or power can prevent Yahweh from keeping his promise to you in Jesus Christ. The supremacy of Yahweh means that his promises are irrevocable and unmovable. And the final thing is this. Yahweh's supremacy means that we owe him our service and our worship. In this life, all sorts of things demand our service. Political ideologies, biased narratives, and even rich celebrities demand our service in the midst of ongoing culture wars. Social media, from Facebook to TikTok, demand your time and your commitment. They stand in the place of Pharaoh and declare that our service is rightfully theirs. Yahweh is supreme to all of these things. He and he alone has the right to our service and worship. Now, sometimes serving Yahweh might look like serving a political party or a particular cultural narrative, but our allegiance and service must be and always be to Yahweh alone. The God of Exodus is the supreme God with unrivaled power. He and he alone is able to deliver us from every evil and keep every promise that he has made to us. And he alone is worthy of our complete and total service and worship. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you are the God who works wonders for your people, that you are the supreme being above all things. We ask that you would continue to work wonders in our community and our lives. Reassure us that you are powerful to deliver and that you will keep your promises. And having this confidence, give us the faith we need to live all our lives in service and worship to you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. By the power of your spirit. Amen. We're going to take our requests to God now. Um, those who are sick, those who are suffering problems, our students, our church ministries, our world, 
Are there any specific things that people would like us to pray for this morning? Let's bow in prayer. Our great God, we do worship you this morning and we thank you for what you have done in the past, how you delivered the people of Israel and how you demonstrated your authority and your power to Pharaoh and to the people of Egypt and to your own people. And we thank you that you used Moses and Aaron to do this. And we are awestruck and we we do commit ourselves in worship and service to you. <clears throat> we thank you that, that you care for us, even um, such a powerful God. We've seen your love demonstrated to us in so many ways, and we bring before you those who are sick and suffering in our congregation and in our family and extended families. We pray for all those who have cancer, who have ongoing health problems, who need surgery. We bring before you those who are suffering from addictions, those who are in recovery, those who are suffering from mental health conditions. We pray for those who are trapped in situations that seem to have no escape. We just pray for your deliverance and your help in all of these situations. We pray for this pandemic and we, we pray for the outbreaks in different parts of this province. And we pray for those who are uh, suffering increased numbers and increased severity of cases around the world. We pray for those countries where vaccines have not rolled out and where help is not available. And Father, these problems are overwhelming to us, but they are not overwhelming to you. So we raise them before you. We ask that you bring an end to this pandemic. And we know you can. <clears throat> Father, we pray for our schools. We thank you that um, schools will be reopening tomorrow and um, that this uh, labor dispute looks like it's been resolved. And we pray as schools open tomorrow, as children of all ages return to classes, that you will keep them safe on the buses and in the classroom and on the playground that you will help them to learn and reach us to being back in school and that you will bless the remainder of this term for their learning and um, for their growth. We pray for all of our students in our congregation who are at post-secondary school. You know we have a list of almost 10 of them, Father, and we pray that you will boost them, that you will use us to boost them and encourage them. You will help them to apply themselves to their studies and do what they need to do and do their very best. We just pray that you will draw near to each of them and that you will make yourself powerfully known to them, and we know you can. We pray for those who are grieving. Father, we've mentioned various families over recent weeks, and today we also lift before you the family of Mary O'Neill. And we just pray for your comfort and your hope. We pray that love will surround that family and the other families that we know who are grieving. We pray for our church ministries. We thank you for Pastor Nathan and for Pastor Sheila. And we pr thank you for Sabrina. And we pray for our team that you will give them the uh, renewal and the confidence to do your work. We pray that you will help them to equip us to do your work as your church here. We thank you for this church. We thank you for all who are volunteering in different ministries. We pray that you will especially bless the plans that are um, underway to work on special things for Christmas. We pray that we would reach out as your congregation in this place to people in this community that need to hear from you and need to know your love and your goodness and that we would welcome all with open arms. We pray for other churches in our community too, that they will hear your voice and that they will follow it and that they will reach out to our community with love. We pray for wisdom for all our church leaders in this community. And Father, we bring before you the many problems in our world. We've said before that these problems are too big for us, but they're not too big for you. 
you know, the suffering and oppression and hunger and poverty and displacement, things going on all around the world that are big. And um, we just pray that the kingdom of heaven, that your kingdom would be with them, that they would see your goodness and your hope and your peace. We pray for deliverance for those who are suffering. And we thank you that you are all powerful and that you love us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. This last song we're going to do is, I'm sure, new to most people, although it's a song from the 1700s. It's a, song, it's a hymn called Great God of Wonders. And I heard this song for the first time in 1984. And it has never left my mind. The chorus is so powerful to me. The, the timing is different. It's talking about God of wonders, and it's mainly talking about the wonder of God's mercy for us, his grace. And there are lots of ways to understand his grace. So um, the words are old-fashioned, but the chorus, I hope, will will sink deep into your soul as it just asks, who, who has a God like we have? We have an amazing God. <coughs>
Paul writes in Romans 11, verses 33 to 36, he says, Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how unscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? Or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. As you go this week, may you remember that you serve Yahweh, the supreme God of Exodus. He is unrivaled in glory, in majesty, and in power. This week, may he deliver you, bless you, and keep you. Amen.